So I'm excited about uh, our fun Tuesday. Um, today I wanted to start doing our kind of survey of other technologies used in data storage. And so this class is a relational database class and we have relational database stuff that we've talked about and we have more to talk about. Uh, but tonight I wanted to start looking at other ways of storing data um, so you become well-rounded data experts. So the first technology I wanted to talk about is called Redis, R-E-D-I-S. Uh, the website is redis.io and we're gonna go through a whole bunch of this information tonight. Um, Redis is a classified as a NoSQL database. So NoSQL is kind of a modern terminology used in the last 10 years where um, the idea for, for putting data in and getting data out of your database is not a SQL statement. SQL is a standard for relational databases and then when you have database technology that's not a relational database you can't really use SQL for it. Um, so Redis is specifically a key value pair database and it does other stuff we'll talk about. Uh, but the, the description is it is an open sourced like open sourced database. It, is an, it supports in-memory data structures and it's used as a database, cache, or message broker. And we'll go through what all that means. Um, the important part here for Redis specifically is it is an it is an in-memory data store. So it does not persist data to a disk. One of the you know, ACID principles that we talk about for a relational database is say, whenever I'm inserting data and I, and I complete a transaction, I know that data is durable. It's, it's stored, I can get it later, even if there's some sort of database crash. Um, Redis does not do that native, or well, an in-memory in database does not do that. It doesn't write it to disk, instead it stores it in memory. Um, and so that, that allows for super, super fast data. Because now we don't have to scan a hard drive to find where the record is to get that record. Um, the benchmarks for Redis as a data store are phenomenal. They're, they're millions of transactions a second on a single node database, which you cannot get in a relational database because it stores things to disk. Now it does store snapshots of that data on regular intervals. So if there is a failure, Redis itself can restart and reload whatever data was previously stored. But since it's on the schedule, any gap in time from the last storage to now, anything that happens in between those could get lost. So that's always something you have to know when you talk about using a data store like Redis to, to be an operational system. Um, so Redis is used heavily for data storage. We'll talk about different uses of that data storage. Um, it supports transactions for multiple operations, just like a SQL trans or database, a uh, relational database does. It has a publish subscribe concept where one process can publish data through Redis and other processes can read that data from Redis. So it's kind of a message broker, but again, it's all in memory, so it's super fast. Um, keys can have TTLs or time to live so keys can be removed based on time. Um, then there are a couple other concepts which, which we don't really, uh, I was gonna go through the first four, but actually we aren't gonna talk about publish subscribe that much. We're really gonna focus on the data storage itself. Um, but for um, running more complex applications or more complex uh, data constraint kind of stuff, it supports running Lua scripts. Lua is a programming language uh, heavily used in kind of just-in-time compiling. Um, so it's a, a simplified programming language that um, can, is typically embedded in something like Redis or other, other applications in general where you want flexibility from a user, an end user like us. Um, LRU, LFU, eviction is a caching concept. So because of Redis's speed, it's 
very regularly used as a caching layer. So if we think about an architectural view of, of an application, you know, if we have web application in the front, relational database in the in uh, relational database storing all of our data in the back, we'll regularly put Redis in there so we can check in memory to see have we seen this data before. If we've seen this data before, get it out of memory and return it to our end user. Super fast. If we haven't seen it before and it's not in our cache, then we'll go to the real database, put it in our cache, and then return it to our end user. So that, that caching concept is um, one of the, remote, probably the most popular use of Redis because of its in-memory speed. Have I lost anyone yet or is everybody with me? One thumb. Sorry, but I didn't hear them. He helped you. I'm okay. Melody, what didn't you get? Where did I lose you? Um, the last part of it, when you tried to explain um, between the like, different layers of architectures. Okay. Um, can I draw something? Let me draw something. Can I do that with that? Ooh, I can. Let's see how this works. I'm gonna to try to draw. So if we think about building, can you see these lines? A web application, right? Like Amazon there. We'll, we'll build Amazon. Writing with the trackpad is hard. When I go on Amazon, I search and I get a whole bunch of results, right? That typically comes from a database. So if I'm searching for a description, something like uh, bike tires, I'll, I'll eventually end up writing a SQL statement, something like select star from products where description like percent tires. I shouldn't have put that there because it's hard to read. Ooh, can I move it? Hey, I can move it. Description. So when I search on, on Amazon or whatever, I'm going to issue a SQL statement to find everything that has the word tires in it. With me so far? Yeah. Yes. Okay. When we do that, uh, where did my drawing go? Okay, here's my drawing. All of that data is stored on a disk you know, spinning media or SSD drives or whatever. And when the database gets that data, it has to pull it all off of, off of the disk, and that's kind of slow, to then return it back to the web app to show it to the user. So uh, uh, Redis is another database. Whoops. It's another database. Um, that stores everything in memory, so there is no disk behind it. And what we can do in our application is we can first check to see if that value is in Redis. And if it is, we'll return it here. And that'll be super fast. Fast. If it's not, so that's like step one. This is how caching works. I check my cache to see if it's there. If it is, great, I return it. If it's not, step two, I get it from my database. Slow, so the first time is slow. And then when it gets returned, I write it to my cache. And then I return the data to the user. So the second time I do this, the second time I make this tires query, I don't have to go to the slow database. Slow database. Because I can basically store the query as a key in Redis. Query is a key. And the value, we're going to talk about these, how we store data in Redis in a second, but the value is the result set. Maybe in JSON or something like that that's easily consumable. That's a query. 
like a query string or something like that, some representation of the query string. So the first time, I have to run the query against my database. The second time, I get it out of, out of memory in Redis. So it's, it's a heck of a lot faster. There's a really good um, chart. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, Google, okay, stop doing this. Uh, speeds, network versus disk. There's a picture I want to find. I usually put it in my slides, but I didn't this time. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. Oh, my annotation didn't go away. How do I clear that? Annotation, clear. Clear. Okay, cool. Um, go away. So there's an image I want to find. Um, measurements every software engineer should know. Oops. Oh, I can't find it. Okay, this is going to be cheesy, but I'm going to do it. Medium, Chris, I have it in a blog post I wrote. So I do some blog posting for the uh, Capital One developer blog. Um, and where are my articles? There's the one. This is what I was looking for. Latency numbers. Every programmer should know. What this is showing us is how fast it is to get data from a different place. So if we read um, data from our CPU cache, which is the memory attached to our CPU, like it, it can't be any closer to our CPU than it is. It takes 0.5 nanoseconds to get data out of that cache. If it's in my level two cache, which is the next set of data still right next to my CPU, it takes seven nanoseconds to get that data out. Nanoseconds are like one one millionth of a second. They're super, super small times. You with me on the scale of that? So basically the memory in the CPU, it takes L2 cache, the level two cache, seven nanoseconds. Main memory to get uh, data out of my main memory is one microsecond, which is one one hundred thousandth of a second. So that's how fast it is to get data out of memory, uh, to find it. To pull um, one kilobyte of data out of main memory is three microseconds. Really, really fast. To send one kilobyte over a one gigabyte network, a pretty fast network. Um, 10 nanos or 10 microseconds SSD 150 microseconds so 50 times slower to read one kilobyte of data off an SSD um, anyway so that's like this is showing the speed to read that memory and so if we have to do a network hop to a database read the data from disk 20 milliseconds to read one meg sequentially off of a disk um, plus the network time plus that you know we read our index first then we get data it's it just shows that it's much much slower to store data on a disk and then retrieve it instead of storing it in memory that's really the point of this i love this picture i show it all the time hey, Chris. Uh, yep so the blue is uh, from the ram you mean ram memory main memory yep Okay. And green is, um, SSD. well, it's showing a bunch of different things. So like the first one, um, random read of data on a one gigabyte per second SSD is 150 microseconds. Reading one megabyte sequentially from memory is 250 microseconds. Round trip in the same data center is typically 500 micro microseconds. 
and on the right, one megabyte sequentially from disk is 20 milliseconds. A traditional disk, not SSD. Correct. Gotcha. Yes, I believe this, this is um, a, a traditional spinning hard drive. Yep. So we know that the memories are much faster than hard drives. So then, then why, if you program it in the way that your uh, objects in your program are uh, well mapped to a database, then you can just keep updating your database, and then when you load up your program, you just load up load the data from the database to all the objects in your program. Mm -hmm. Why do you need this type of in-memory data? So that's a fantastic question, and hold that until uh, a couple slides in, okay? okay. Really good question. Um, okay, so let's start looking at this. So if you think about data storage, let me get rid of this again. Maybe I'll keep it up here. If we think about data storage, like now we're getting into object modeling. Everything in Redis is a key. So we think about everything is, is found by a single string, a key. It's a key value pair, typically. Um, so we looked at JSON, and JSON has you know attributes in the model, right? You can almost think about the key, um, a couple ways to think about the key. I don't actually like this. I wrote this 20 minutes ago, and I don't like it, uh, the, even a column in the relational database. The key is more like the primary key of the object or of the record. So the key in Redis is like a primary key in our database. Um, keys are not like a table. Uh, the value associated with the key is more like a row on the table. So Redis doesn't have tables. It doesn't have joins. It doesn't do anything like that. Oops. Um, so if we think about keys and values, the values in Redis can either be a string data type, which is a simple binary string. It can be a list, which is like an array with, uh, it's a collection of string elements sorted by order of insertion. It's like a linked list. A set is a collection of unique unsorted strings. A sorted set is a collection of unique, for sets, unique is the keyword, sorted strings. Now we start to get more complex, we can have a hash, which is a key, the value for a hash is a set of keys and values. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. Um, then there's some other really like math, smart data science kind of stuff. Um, there's a bitmap structure where you can flip individual bits in the data. In the data. Um, but the fun one, in my opinion, is a hyperlog log, just because I like saying that. Um, it's a probabilistic data structure that's used to estimate how many unique values there are in a set of data. So tackling that one piece at a time. Does anybody know what a probabilistic data structure is? Or what is the, what is the opposite of probabilistic? Improbabilistic? Yeah. Certain. Determinist, deterministic is what I'm thinking. So a probabilistic data structure is, uh, in this case, the data structure is, is used to say, um, over time I have seen this many unique values, whatever those values represent. We as the, the integrators can store a list of SQL queries to say, how many individual SQL queries were run in my data center today. Like that's a good use case for a hyperlog log. Um, I'll show you examples to get into that more. But probabilistic means it's, it may not be exact. So if we think about keeping the individual uh, or, or keeping a count of unique uh, SQL statements or queries on my website, um, when I get in the, you know, the scale of 12 million different things, it might tell me it's 11.9 million and not 12 million. Or it might tell me it's 12 million and three when it's really 12 million and 10. So it's, it's very, very close. And there's a defined margin of error and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, if we think about um, data types here, 
compared to our SQL or our, our relational database stuff, um, a string is used to store the individual fields we would store in a row in our tables. First name, last name, etc. Even if it's a number, it's stored as a string. Everything's a string. A list is to store a collection of data um, that, that can have duplicates in the list, but the order of insertion matters. So it is a an ordered data set. So would, you would use this to, to model things like um, a line at the movie theater, right? Where we queue up, we get in line, and when it's our turn, we get out of the line. That kind of data structure is, or this a list is, is used for that kind of model. Um, sets are, are are a collection of data that it, everything in there is unique. So even if I try to add the same string or the same name 12 times, uh, it's only in the set once. The reason the um, sets are like that is it's a much more efficient data way of storing a unique list. And so when we when we look at our data model, we have to figure out which data type do we need. Do we need a, an ordered list or do we just need to know unique values? Or even do we need to know a sorted list of unique values, where unique values is, is um, the important part. So let's look at the commands. So Redis is a very, um, it, it has a nicely defined interface on how we interact with it. Um, this is where things are going to start. We can start um, comparing these to SQL, or what, what these would look like in SQL. So um, we'll see things like get and set and delete and update, those kind of commands throughout this, depending on the data type. So when it comes to interfaces, SQL is a high-level generic um, interface. Regardless of the database engine behind it, we can, we can supply SQL to it. Redis is a custom-built interface, so it has custom commands based on what we're trying to do. Oh, actually, I wanted to show the website. So on their website, there is a section for commands. And you'll see it there. It's just a whole bunch of stuff. At the top, though, we can filter by what we want to look at. So if I wanted to look at my, my string functions, I could pull up string. And I get a list of the commands for my strings. If I wanted to look at my hyperlog log commands, I can look at my hyperlog log commands or my hashes, whatever I wanted to do. Um, geo is new, so I don't, I'm not familiar with the geo stuff, but it looks like it's going to provide most of our geo um, functions like distance and boundaries and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of cool. All right, so let's look at some string commands. So basic string commands are things like set, set, set x, x, ex means expire, expiration um, in a, with a TTL. So TTL is a time to live. Are you are y'all familiar with that concept? Time to live for for data. Yep. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Is anyone anyone not? And not for the data. Okay. Uh, the idea for TTL is this piece of data is valid for a certain amount of time. So, uh, in in this case, I would set a key in Redis and I would give it a three second time to live or a 10 second time to live or a three hour time to live. When that time period is up, the key disappears. It just goes away. So that's really important when we talk about caching because the, the problem with a cache, going back to the diagram I tried to squiggle along here earlier, if the data in the database changes, while I have the data in the cache, my cache doesn't know that it changed. They're two separate systems. So when we cache things, we will always put it, always, big strong word, we will usually always put a time to live on that data so we can always go back to the source, the true source of data occasionally just to make sure we have the newest data. So the way Redis works, this, there's a command line interface for it called Redis CLI, command line interface. Um, 
it is accessible in every major or probably every programming language, Python, C, Java, etc. They all have libraries to do this kind of stuff. Um, but I'll be showing you what it looks like on the command line. So this is kind of the low level interaction with Redis. So from this command line interface, I'm going to create a new key or set the value of a key. The command looks like, actually I'll pull up the definition of what it looks like in the documentation and then I'll show it to you. So set, I'm going to find the key set. So here I can set a key, the key name, to a value. Then there are a bunch of op operational param or optional parameters after that. But we'll talk about these three primary. Set the key name to the value. So if I look at the command line, I'm setting my key name, I'm creative, with the value of this is my key value. So the key name is a string. The key value is a string. I can then get my key name. And the return is this is my key value because that's what I just set it to. So then um, the set X, so set expiration, which is a TTL in seconds, set my key name with a TTL of three, and the value will disappear in three seconds. And I say, it says, okay. I turn around quickly and I get the value of my key name, and it says, will disappear for three seconds. I stand up, I sit down, I try it again, and I get no value. Because the time to live for that key expired, so it, it disappeared. So when we do caches, um, if we were caching for a website, uh, something like product descriptions on, on our shopping Mike Spikes website, um, we would probably do a TTL of, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, something like that, where we could search on those descriptions and get the results really, really fast. Um, something we may not want to cache is the inventory count. Like, do I have them in stock? Because in an operational database, um, somebody could be purchasing them as we're looking them up. So I may have to uh, have a TTL of the, of the how many are in stock to be much shorter than the TTL of, of the description of the item. Does that make sense? Okay, um, a couple other basic string commands. Uh, string length, how big is the string? How many characters are in the string? Append, if I wanna add to the string, I can append data to it. And then get set is if the thing exists, get the existing value, but I wanna change it to something new. As opposed to issuing a get command and then a set command, you can do it all together. It's, it's, it's uh, convenient. Now, a couple of, of uh, things I'm gonna throw at you that are minor, minor wrinkles. A, the string commands, you have increment. Increment by, increment float, decrement, decrement by, decrement by float. Why do I say those are interesting? Are you using a string? Because I'm using things like inter increment on a string. That's exactly right. What do you typically increment? What data type do you typically increment? Integers. Yeah, numeric kind of stuff, right? But what did I say at the beginning? Maybe that you're going to use it with TTL, maybe? Good thought. Do I have any other data types besides oh. a string? Yeah, because every value is a string, so a number is going to be a string. Uh-huh. And that's that's what I, that's what I think is interesting. I, I, I'm really surprised they did this, but I think it's, it's just for convenience. So here's an example. I can set my key to the value of 1. Okay? I'll get the value of my key, and I get a string value of 1. I can get the string length of that key, and I get 1. Then I can increment it by 10, 
and the new value is 11. I can get the key and it sure looks like a string still. And then the string length is two. So they are stored as strings, but you can still do things like counting or um, incrementing, decrementing inventory. Like you can add and remove, add and subtract uh, numbers to it as if it were a number. But if you're doing anything in like a, a programming API, like in a Java library where types matter, the value coming out of Redis will always be a string. So you're, you're going to have to parse it into an integer if you want to treat it like an integer in your code. But those commands exist. Any questions on the strings? I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. What all the command lines? They all start with being 127. Like, it looks like an IP address. It is. Host. Yep. That, so when I run... Um, the command line when I run, uh, oh shoot, come back here. When I r run Redis CLI, it, it is, a, com it is an, a program that connects to Redis over a network port. So it's just telling me that my lo um, it is connected to localhost on port 6379. So when I, when I copy and paste things like that, it's just, I'm just copying and pasting that. I see. Yep. So, so the, com it, the command yeah. starts here. Okay. So Redis is it just is it still using as SQL, but just for a different application, a program, or software, or no, it, it, it doesn't look like SQL to me. It's it's not, it's not oh. SQL at all. Okay. It is a a no SQL database. So when we. Like in what circumstances or scenarios we use this sort of language, but not SQL? So um, the, the Redis itself is a database, but it is not a relational database. And SQL, uh, for the most part, 95%, 99% of the time, is only used on relational databases. So there is no... Forget everything about SQL for this discussion. It's it's, it's custom commands. Um, and and so going to like their examples of when you use Redis. Uh, where is the documentation? Learn more. So Redis is you do 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 do. Oh, when there's a good document on here like when you would use Redis, but there there are tons of reasons to do it. Anytime you need super fast speed. Is, is step one. Um, when I have used Redis historically, it's primarily as that in-memory cache of data, C-A-C-H-E, cache, um, that word, cache, or it's just a database storage. So we'll, we'll talk about it, the data set or data type hashes in a second, um, but I have used Redis to act as a uh, data store, a database, so I could have a user write some configuration items to Redis from my web application. But then I would have another application read that data to update a configuration file on a data on a on a system. So like the last appliance I built, the last two appliances I built, um, my user could change my the IP address, the the host name, those kind of things of my server. And instead of having them go to edit the, fi the configuration files in Linux, I could give them a nice little interface to do it on the web, on a website, or uh, a com even a nicer command line application. And that application would write the data to, a, a, um, to Redis. And I could have one program on the back, so back end reading that data and writing it to the real configuration files. That way with my web application didn't have to write directly to the, the configuration files. My command line didn't have to write directly to the config files. It kind of wrote to that intermediary database. So in that case, I could have used a SQL, a, a Postgres database. But since I was using Redis for a whole bunch of other stuff, I just used it for that too. So I have two extra questions. The first thing, if I start to build a new system from scratch, let's say, you know, we have the web and had anything in place yet, so we started to do something new and refreshing. Yeah. 
So we start with, we can choose either going with the relational database and after that we can use SQL to filter, query, whatever after that we or we can go with Redis, a different type of database and it's not relational database. Correct. And so the reason I really love, I really want to talk about these other databases in this class is so you can learn the differences and so you can pick the right tool for the job. If, if currently we have the, the, the database that currently we're having right now is relational database and we realize that it might be more useful and beneficial and advantageous, whatever, and we want to just convert it to Redis, do we? Can we do that? Or is it possible? Or is it kind of we have to restart the whole cycle? You, you basically have to start over. Easier said than done. Yeah, so because there's you can't like convert to a relational model to Redis easily. It's it, it'd be a heavy change in an application. I got it. Thank yep. you. So this is more mapped out by the the architect who's putting this together beforehand, right? Exactly. Yeah, that, that's exact, exactly right. If your role is, is data modeling, I think awareness is good, right? You, you Knowing options is a good thing. If you're working with an architect who is designing the system, they will probably be the ones to talk about why you would use Redis in addition to or instead of or you know what you're you know, going through like the, the non-functional requirements of speed. Those kind of things are what goes into choosing your database. So I was thinking, I mean, this could be used as a, um, if, if you need like, like a quick processing, like, a, like quick results, um, just for certain aspects of an application, but then you store a lot more data in the back end, then this can be used to kind of be an intermediary of sorts. Or... It, it, exactly. That, so that's the, the kind of caching concept, you know, think about, um, yeah, going, going back to Amazon as an example, I don't know Amazon's architecture or implementation, but if you have 5,000 people issuing the same query within five minutes of each other, databases are big and expensive to run. So if you have those 5,000 users hitting the same database for the same question, that's going to be kind of expensive. Now, databases do their own caching and stuff like that, but if you can temporarily store that data in an intermediary cache, then only the first one has to hit the actual database. Everybody else goes to the in-memory cache and they get results really quickly. Databases are typically your bottleneck in an application like that when you have to scale them to uh, you know, hundreds, thousands of users. So this takes this takes some load off the database, or it can if you use it for a cache. Great questions though. This is and these are this is exactly why I love doing this, this survey. I say it like I've done it before, but I wanted to do it before. Um, all right, let's look at some other data types in here. So lists are a a ordered set of data. So some of the commands on a list. L range, list range, name of list. In this case, imagine this being an array in memory. I want to get from index zero to index 100, or from zero, I want to get 100 items. Well, my list is new, so there's nothing in my list. But the command, Redis knows since I'm doing, I put L in front of it or their convention is because it's a list command, it has an L at the beginning of it. That's not always accurate, but for here it is. Um, now, a list is a, an array. So um, I assume everyone is, is uh, at least conceptually aware of what an array is, right? It's multiple things in a, um, in programming it's typically in sequential memory. So if I have a list, uh, I, I need to add things to my list. So I have a couple of ways I can do that. The thing I love about Redis lists 
is that there's the concept of left and right, beginning and end. So I have a couple commands, R push, R is right. I am pushing, meaning adding, a new item on my list, the value of one, on the right. So if I have an empty list and I'm pushing one item, cool, that's the only item in the list. Now if I right push another item, it's now my second item. Right push another one, it's my third item. I could L push to insert something at zero on the left. But if I've R pushed three items, the first item is the first one I pushed in. The second is the second and the third is the third. the third is the third in the list because it's an ordered list. So looking at commands again, um, I have, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. L push, so I can push to the left, on the left. Um, R push, I can push on the right. And I think there's a L insert. So I can insert something in the middle of the list by um, by index, I think. Oh no, I can even I can do it by before or after a certain thing. So that's kind of even cooler. Um, so anyway, so now I've I've pushed three items onto my list. L range again is show me the things from the left, so I can R range it if I want to see it reverse. Um, but anyway, left, so L range, I want to see all the things 0, 1, 2, 3 that I pushed in. Uh-oh, I typed 3 wrong. So I got to fix that. Now, because I have left and right to deal with, I can R pop. R pop means remove and give me the rightmost value. So I can either R pop... Um, Let's see, our pop is here. Is there just a remove? So I can just remove, left remove. Then there's probably a right remove somewhere in here. Or remove. Well, maybe there's not. Blocking, blocking. Left pop, left remove, right pop. Oh, well, there's no right remove. That's kind of funny. Anyway, um, see, I learn things all the time. So right pop means give me the last value, or the rightmost value. And so it gave me the value T-H-R-E. And so I'm, and then I can say, well, I'm going to add the, right, the correct spelling of the word three, and now I have one, two, three again. Now I can left pop my new list, and it gave me one. L range again. I only see two and three because one was removed. L index says, give me the item at index one. As if it were a zero, a zero indexed list. The first item is index zero. As it should be. So, a use for this that I have used this for many times is basically issuing or, or maybe putting new data in a work queue. So I have one program that's always right pushing new data. So if you think about the list, I'm adding stuff to the right to grow my list of work queue items. The worker application pulls from the left because that's going to be the oldest item. That's how you build a first in, first out queue. So my newest items go in the right, and my oldest items I take out of the left. And then I do that work item, then I go back, is there anything else in my queue? You can also use this list as a stack, a different data type, where it's not a first in, first out data type, it's a last in, first out data type. So I, I would right push but I would also left, I'm sorry, right push and right pop. So the, the work queue is the newest thing in the queue. 
there are many reasons to use a stack instead of a queue, um, but it's it's more. Um, I think we use queues more than we use stacks. Stack is like the quarters in your coin holder in your car, and you push down the new quarters, and when you pull out a quarter, it's the last one you put in. That's a stack. So stacks are used for like if you were building a text editor and you wanted to, you know, type some stuff, type some more stuff, then control Z undo the last thing you typed in. That's the the popping off the stack. That order of things that come off is is um, the reverse order of when they put in last in first out. So the list in array can do both of those things, or you can treat it as if it were a queue or a stack. Good. Or did I put everybody else to sleep? I got one thumbs up. Thank you for the thumbs up. Clapping, thumbs up, cool. Interaction, yes. All right, um, sets. So sets, like I said, are a unique collection of data, but it's unordered. And here's a great showcase of that. So now I have a new function going back to my, or command, sorry, go back to my Redis commands. I can look at the functions under sets. So s add set add. Same structure as most others. The key is the first parameter. So I'm set adding to my new set is my key. Now in a set, I can add more than one string value at one time. So I'm inserting the value one, the value two, the value three, the value four, and surrounded by quotes, the value multi-string. So I've inserted five new values into my set. So I have another command s members set members and when i execute that against my my new set key i get all the values in that set anyone notice anything about the values in the set they're in, order. They're in a different order than they were put in So I, I put them in order one, two, three, four multi-string, and I got them back four, two, one, three multi-string. What order does the database store them in? Who knows? It's a data type or data structure that is supposed to be there for efficiency. So maybe it's some sort of binary tree or something like that, but we don't care. All we know is that they're in there in some order and it only stores unique values. So let's make another set. Set add my other set capital two, lowercase two, capital three, lowercase three. This is a big string as a single value. I can get S members, and again, it comes out in some order. Order is irrelevant, it does not matter. Anyone familiar with set theory? Never heard the word set theory before. I've heard it. Heard it? Can explain it. I can barely explain it either. Um, the idea is a set is a collection of things. Think of Venn diagrams, right? A set is a circle in our Venn diagram with stuff in the middle. Another set has stuff in it as well. They're different sets. We can perform operations on those things like intersect. So where do those two sets intersect making our Venn diagram? So here I can do S inter as an intersect and I give it two sets and the return value here is the things that are in both sets so it's one of the set operations or multi-set operations you can issue you can see if something is in a set s is member my new set the value three and in that case yes it was one means true one means yes S is member and I something that's not there, and the value returned to zero. So it's not in that set. There's a S rand member. S random member, my new set. 
Just give me something. I don't care what it is. Give me some random thing that's in the set. An S card is set cardinality. How many items are in my set? So going off the intersect, more towards our set theory stuff, um, we have intersect. We have union, meaning take my two sets and put them together into one set. Um, and then you can actually store that as another set. You can remove things from your set, um, move a member from one set to another, S pop, you can actually pop something out of your set, but again, it's a random member because there's no order. Um, S is member. So there's a whole bunch of different stuff. S difference, so you can subtract sets. So S diff, I have one set and another. I can subtract the second set from the first and the result is a, a set of its own. Or you can find the elements that are on, that are basically only in the first set. Yes, that's right. So if I have set A and set B, and I subtract B from A, the result are the things that were unique in A. Because I've taken everything out of B that was, or everything out of A that was in B. That's what set subtraction is. So that's the set theory, is being able to do those kind of operations on sets of data. Um, hashes. This is where we start to see things that look kind of like a table in a relational database. Kind of. So we have a like set for a string. We have H set for a hash. So here I have a, a new uh, secondary key. So the key for a hash is a single string key like everything else we've seen so far. So I'm creating a hash called person underscore one. And I'm setting an attribute, first name, which is another string attribute, with a value of Chris. H set, again, person one, last name, Fauerbach. H set person one, email, my email address. Then I can get that specific attribute from that hash. H get, person one is the hash email is the attribute, and the return is the value. Another command, h get all, tells me everything that was in that hash. So the return is the key, or the, the field name, then the value, the field name, then the value, the field name, then the value. Now when we take this to like a, a programming language like Python, when I run the h get all command, my return is a Python dictionary of key values, which looks an awful lot like a JSON structure, which is really a nice way of, of taking whatever data is in the database and putting it into an object that I can now deal with in Python. Other commands are key H keys. So what are the, the sub keys or the attributes of that record? I can delete a specific attribute, H-D-E-L, and I see if I, when I H get all, it no longer has an email address. Hashes, let's see what else there is. H increment by, so now I can increment and decrement my value on the sub key within my hash. Um, how many fields are in the hash, H len. Um, H vowels, all the all the values, H string length. So you'll see that the standard key commands basically get duplicated into the hash, into the list of hash commands. H exists like exists. Oh, I think that's something I skipped. I meant to say that earlier. Oh, no, 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 that's later, sorry. Okay, hashes. So now you can see here if we were, Melody, to I think your question earlier, if we were to start moving data or, or storing data in, an, in a structure within Redis and we wanted it to feel like a row in a database table, the hash starts to get us there. 
because we have the, the key person one to represent a single row in our table. The sub keys would represent the individual columns in our table. So if I had another person, if I had an eight, if I had a person two, first name could be different, last name could be different, email could be different. Now the thing that you don't, you can't do in Redis that you can do in uh, a relational database is you can't predefine this structure. You can't have the database put constraints on things and say a last name must exist. That's, that, move, that, that responsibility moves to your application and not the database itself. Can you repeat the last sentence? Like, mm -hmm. what we cannot do in SQL? Oh, I'm sorry, in relational yep. database. So in a relational database, if I had a person table, I could have a first name, last name, and an email address, and I could make those not nullable. So they'd have to have a value, right? Yes. I can't do that in Redis. I, Redis, I cannot tell Redis that a hash must have an attribute email. So if your application requires an email attribute on your person, your app, your code, your web app, your whatever application you wrote that interacts with Redis, that application has to control the data, the, the data constraints, because this database will not do that for you. Does this specific or particular data will make or will control or will, like, put in the constraints with the specific data, not the not how we define it with our database in the beginning before we actually put the data in. Correct. So, so if you had a web application you were building to collect usernames, that application would have to make sure you had a first name, last name, and an email address because the database won't do that for you. It can't do that for you. So what if we lack out some of information but we still want to input the data? Mm -hmm. So would it tell us the error? Do you return error to us or? No, they're, they're, that's what I'm saying. There's no error. I, there's no there's no requirement for a specific field on a hash. That that's not a feature the database provides you. Understand. Thank you. Yep. So your Java code or your Python code would have to do that before it wrote to the, to Redis. Um, and over the next couple of Tuesdays on my Tuesday fun days, hopefully y'all are enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. Um, when we move away from relational databases to other NoSQL databases, um, we will see more things like that, where the database has less constraints around what you can put into it. Like there are no relationships within Redis. There's no foreign key concept. The primary key is the, the name of the, of the key. The, that's basically the primary key. Um, and the last one I want to talk about, I still got 10 minutes, uh, hyperlog logs. I like this one just because the name is super cool and we talked about it a little bit. Um, the hyperlog log data structure can be used in order, can be used to count unique elements in a set using a very small and constant amount of memory. Specifically, it's 12 kilobytes of memory for every log, hyperlog log key that you create. The returned cardinality of the observed set is not exact, but approximated with a standard error of 0.8%. What that means is, this is a data structure that does, so if we have a set data structure, it stores the unique values in it. You can get back the unique values in a set. And therefore, you can count deterministically actual count with a margin of error of zero you can count how many items are in your set but if you put 17 million items in your set 
you are taking up a good bit of memory. 17 million times the average length of the strings that you have in your set. So if you're if each string in there was 100 bytes of data, now you're using 17 million times 100 bytes of data. That's a lot of memory, right? To get that unique count of that field. You can use a hyperlog log where you don't need that exactness. No matter how many items you add to a hyperlog log, the memory used does not change beyond 12 kilobytes. But the cost of that is that now you are not deterministic. You, you don't have an error of 0%. You have a little bit of a standard error of 0.8% over very, very large data sets. And you cannot get back the unique values you put into the data set. So how you would use this, there's a PF add. I don't know what PF stands for. It's not hyperlog log. I add a, for my key of my hyperlog log, my HLL, I add the word dog, cat, cat. Now it is a unique set. So you can see the second time I added cat, it says, no, it's already there. So that's what it's supposed to do. I'll add two, three, period, period, period over time, ellipsis, I'm adding three million more. Imagine I was adding three million more records. Then I could call this, use this PF count command to say how many unique values did I give you? And it will give you a, the correct result within 0.8% error, with a 0.8% standard error. So if you were running a um, if you want to get statistics about like a website usage, how many different queries did my, how many different things did my users type in my search box? Or how many um, users accessed a certain system? This can give you a directionally accurate number of questions like that. But no matter how big that data set gets, it's only, it's, it's only 12 kilobytes of data. That's the magic of a hyperlog log. Oh, then a couple of things uh, running through quickly to get to my last slide, which is the, the where you get to think stuff. Um, I can set my key. I can add a TTL to my key, my existing key, using the expire command. I can get the time to live for my, my key. So I've added a two minute TTL to my key TTL three seconds later was 117 seconds. Two seconds later it was 115 seconds because you know it's counting down time. And then I can say, ah, eh, take away the TTL, make this a persistent key. So I can use a persist command for that. And you can see now the TTL is negative one is a magic magic number. I can check if a key exists. I can delete a key. Then you can see it then I exists again and it says nope, doesn't exist. Then there are other commands like keys store, uh, with a wildcard sy syntax where I can list keys. This is how, well, no, that's the question on the next slide. I won't give you that answer yet. Now uh, there's re rename, random key, dump, touch. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, there, there are hundreds of commands in Redis and they just keep adding more with every version. So taking Redis as a database structure or as a database, if we wanted to use this to store data in Mike's Bikes, what kind of data structure would we use for customers? What data type? Hash, maybe? Yeah, we would, hash, yeah. we would use a hash. Same thing for bikes, we would use a hash. How would I store multiple customers' data? List. <laughs> eh, that'll just store a list of strings. So we could use a list to store the identifiers of multiple users. Do a set of hashes? Can't do a set of hashes. Good thought. Um, hashes, lists, sets. Oh, sorry. Sets, lists, 
hyperlog logs, the only data type they can store as a string. If I go back here, here's my hint. Keys. Keys is how I could list all my users, all my persons. So I could do keys, person, wildcard. So for a an application like Mike Spikes, Redis would never be our primary data store. Redis would never be our primary. Yeah, I, I, I'm comfortable saying that. Our primary data store will be Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, whatever, a, 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 re, a re, relational database. But if we wanted to cache this kind of data or temporarily store this kind of data, our keys, our key names become our unique identifiers for a record. So we could do some construct like if we have stored the data in our relational database, in a person's table, I could do something like table name underscore primary key value. So person one would be the equivalent to my relational database's primary key value of one. Person underscore two would be related to 